Hey everyone, really glad to be with you here today. Uh, I'm so glad for the introduction that uh, Daniel gave to Inner, Inner Source, uh, especially uh, to his emphasis on starting with uh, people and culture first. So I'm going to talk about efforts uh, that we've had at Nike and getting people to opt in to Inner Source behavior at scale across the company. So my role at Nike is I am the director of developer of developer collaboration. Uh, so our goal is to make it easy for ad hoc scaled peer-to-peer -peer interaction and collaboration to happen across the company. Uh, we think our uh, agile org does a very good job uh, within a particular business train, uh, within a particular product at organizing development. Uh, but we have needs that span across uh, multiple release trains, multiple business units, where the same problems keep popping up over and over again. And there's no dedicated team that's going to solve those for everyone. Uh, so without some broad uh, system for developers collaborating together, people are going to be stuck solving the same problems over and over again within their organizational silos. Uh, There's one example of this. Uh, a lot of teams at the company uh, use Kubernetes and containers uh, to manage their deployed solutions. Uh, there are certain uh, challenges uh, and things that teams need to figure out about running Kubernetes successfully uh, in, a, in one of the, the cloud providers that Nike uses. Uh, we don't want that to be figured out over and over again, but we'd like to make it very easy for engineers to come together to share ideas, best practices, and working code and solutions uh, all, all across the company. Uh, so that's the the goal of my uh, my team is to enable that for all types of of shared problems uh, problems that happen. And we see InnerSource as one of the highest, most skilled, most mature ways that we can enable that kind of knowledge sharing. Uh, so what I'm going to do is talk about how we uh, evangelize those practices within the culture that we have at Nike, uh, which is very much a culture of just do it. Uh, so at Nike, this is more than a marketing slogan that we uh, share with athletes and consumers. Uh, inside the company, it also per permeates the way that software development happens. Uh, software teams are largely free to choose their own tooling, to choose their own uh, development processes, uh, which is both a, a blessing and then a challenge in getting folks to uh, adopt inner source way of working at scale. Uh, on the one hand, teams are free to engage in inner source software, uh, to work together, to collaborate. Uh, but then on the other hand, there's no kind of overarching guiding structure that we can enforce from above to, to make sure it happens. Uh, so what we've had to do is we've had to learn a lot about people and culture just as much or more than inner source in order to get this to be successful. Uh, so we've learned how to tap into the inborn motivations that people already have and then to direct those toward an inner source uh, way of working. Uh, we've learned about social change, uh, about culture and group dynamics and how they work, and learned how to position inner source and the way we train people on inner source to tap into those natural motivators and natural lines of up-leveling that people already have. Uh, with this approach, uh, myself and the small team that I work with have been able to have a very big effect at enabling collaboration and inner source at scale, uh, even without uh, organizational authority or hierarchy uh, in order to do so. So let me explain how that works. What we found is that inner source is just one behavior on a broad continuum or a maturity model of collaborative behavior. And what I'm going to share with you is three dimensions of collaborative behavior uh, on which we can plot inner source. So there's more dimensions uh, than this, but these are just the three uh, key ones. And all of these dimensions that I'll explain to you refer to the way that a person or a team interacts or collaborates on some shared solution with others that are not on their same scrum team, not a part of their same agile, agile org. So let me say it. I think it'll become clear as I, I give some examples. So one uh, dimension or aspect of how people collaborate is what we call the artifact that people collaborate on. And our ideal with inner source is that people are going to collaborate on code. They're going to collaborate on working solutions. Uh, I gave the example of uh, a Kubernetes before. Maybe there's some uh, shared way of managing you know, clusters of, of, of uh, Kubernetes or shared, uh, shared containers in the cloud at Nike. Uh, where we can bottle up solutions in, as code and contribute in an inner source fashion, that's what we want people to do. That's the ideal. Another dimension of or, or aspect of maturity and how people collaborate together is what we call the criticality of the thing that they're collaborating on. And our ideal is that people are unblocked in their mainline daily work through inner source. Uh, when I have a problem that's on my roadmap and there's some, something I need, some dependency that needs to be updated, uh, that I, as an engineer at the company, feel enabled to go and contribute that to the solution to the, the project or product, wherever that may be. Again, that's the ideal. 
Uh, the last dimension that we'll call is organizationally, with whom do I feel enabled to collaborate this way? And our ideal is that anyone at the company uh, is my collaborative partner uh, in, in some sort of inner source solution. Uh, so this is the ideal. This is where we want to achieve. This is where uh, we work to get to every day. Uh, but we find that that's uh, actually very uh, difficult. It requires a lot of skill uh, to have people take their mainline daily uh, coding uh, and get it done with anyone else across the company. There's a lot of shared culture, a, a lot of shared mindset that needs to happen to get there. And it's difficult for people to jump all the way in, for them to jump all the way to the right on this maturity model. And so we've identified, uh, mostly through observation, behaviors that are a little further to the left on the model, a little easier to engage in, require a little less skill, a little more entry level, but nonetheless are a point of preparation for behaviors that are further on the right, you know, where we'd like to see kind of toward full inner source. Uh, furthermore, we see if we can get people engaging further to the left, they'll start naturally up-leveling themselves along these three dimensions until they get closer and closer to that rightmost behavior that we want to see. So these uh, dimensions, this maturity model, isn't something that we made up. It's something that we've observed, that we saw happening. And as we've articulated it and began to use it and intentionally try to up-level people, along these three dimensions of maturity. Uh, it yields um, a, very, a very easy up-leveling. It's very natural for people. And this has played out all around the company. And as I've shared this at conferences like this one, it's rung true for others as well. So we believe it to be true and it's been very useful for us. Um, so let's, let's go ahead and talk then about uh, some of these uh, preparatory points of maturity that allow us to up-level folks gradually uh, toward the right. Uh, first of all, on that top dimension, uh, which is the artifact that people produce when they're collaborating. You know, we love for code and, and working solutions to be collaborated everywhere, on, everywhere. But further to the left, uh, one way people can start is to just get them talking with people that are on their team. Uh, sharing ideas is a powerful way to get started. And it makes sense. It's very difficult to have the idea that I'm going to code a solution with someone if I don't even have the habit of talking. So one example the thing that we do here is in addition to enabling inner source, uh, my group, the company, enables a broad, robust uh, series of open community meetups happening inside the company. Every week, there are now hundreds of engineers that come together uh, to talk uh, and to collaborate on all kinds of shared, uh, shared concerns, shared tech technologies. Uh, in the example I gave er earlier, there's a Kubernetes group that meets together just to share best practices, gotchas that they're finding. There are similar groups that do so around other shared concerns like accessibility or, or observability. Uh, we find that this is a, a common entry point that can get a lot of people thinking in a collaborative mindset that get them thinking that it's okay for me to work with and to get good ideas from other folks. And that gets them ready for code collaboration later on. Now, as a, as a midpoint between talking with other people and coding with them, uh, we also find it useful to encourage people to co-produce pieces of writing or documentation. Uh, this can look like if if contributing code uh, to a project is too much, maybe somebody can contribute an update to the user documentation. Uh, some of our talking groups that, it, that I had mentioned uh, with behavior further on the left, uh, there's a, an API standards group that meets regularly. We're able to help them move from just talking about API standards to documenting to them together and documenting them in a Git repository in Markdown where they submit pull requests uh, for proposed updates to the standard and go through a, a pull request process to approve those. There's another one of those describing how we do uh, permissions in our AWS accounts. Again, people submit pull requests to this documentation from all over. It's not exactly working on code together, but you can see through going through the pull request workflow, um, the shared co-creation workflow, again, we're building that muscle. And we see a lot of people as they go from talk and then docs, uh, they naturally want to start coding together. I mean, you get a bunch of engineers together writing about what they're going to do, talking about what they're going to do. Uh, it's almost inevitable. People are going to start coding together. So we see people voluntarily like opt in to inner source behavior if we can just get them started along this dimension of maturity. Great. So that's one. Uh, let's go to the next one and talk about the criticality of what people are collaborating on. Again, we'd like mainline daily work to get done, uh, but that can be tough. It takes a lot of skill. How does that balance out with my spr sprints? Uh, what does that mean for my uh, my uh, safe, agile commitments or what my product owner think. Uh, so just to get people started, uh, they can start on some kind of side project. 
Uh, this could be things like a hackathon or innovation time. Uh, we had one group at Nike that built a mobile app to give people an alert when there was free catering available when a, a meeting was over, <laughs> for example. Uh, just a project for fun. But again, the collaborative muscle, this idea that I can work on code with people who aren't on my team uh, uh, builds that builds that mindset and really leads people for this middle step where's where where most folks get started on shared coding projects which is what i'll call a support project okay uh, so a support project is something that uh, is critical to me getting my mainline daily work done uh, but it's not in and of itself uh, my mainline work uh, let me give an example so at nike probably like at your your company um, there's uh, there are many teams that produce some kind of api service Okay, uh, for you know, for some business domain, and that API service needs to be deployed out to the cloud. So that process of deployment, that deployment pipeline, the quality checks, uh, setting up observability and moderate uh, monitoring, uh, all of that deployment process uh, can be a shared project that multiple API services use. That deployment pipeline is what I'd call a support project. It's critical to me getting my job done around my API service. I have to have to deploy it, right? But it is not in and of itself my API service. It's just something that supports that. And uh, again, around deployment pipelines, we have a, a rich ecosystem of people uh, contributing fixes, updates, enhancements to shared deployment pipelines that can be used by dozens or hundreds of projects within the company. In the inner source commons, there are a lot of a lot of stories of at companies of folks getting a real start to something valuable around intersource uh, through these deployment pipelines or DevOps projects. Uh, me is how I got my start in intersource. I was a, a team lead doing a website deployment, and we had a shared deployment pipeline for Nike's websites. It was used by a handful of websites at first, and that ended up growing to the point where uh, dozens and then hundreds of websites throughout the company ended up ended up using it. Uh, so that's that uh, support project criticality. And again, that builds the muscle where people can then start working on their mainline daily work in inner source fashion. You know, maybe if I was at API service, all of a sudden I realized I can do more than just contribute to someone else's deployment uh, pipeline. I may take in pull requests for new features in the API. If I can't deliver them, my consumers can, uh, can update that. And then I'm doing inner source on my mainline project. Organizationally, uh, that bottom uh, dimension, uh, the easiest thing to start with is with sibling teams uh, within uh, just some, some small cross-team efforts, usually within my same organizational structure, my same agile, my same structure, my same release train. Uh, the Daniel had talked uh, previously about the culture that's involved uh, with sibling teams. Uh, they're uh, uh, closer to being under one, uh, one leader, one way of working, so the culture is a little closer. There's probably some assumed norms that make it easier to collaborate. Uh, an organizational leader can set aside social space or time in order for people to engage in intersource. Uh, that's a little easier. Uh, in the middle is engaging with other business units, uh, a little more difficult because there's not necessarily any shared uh, culture or one single leader that can sanction or give space to this activity. And then kind of all the way across the company is, is the most, uh, most difficult, but also yields the highest rewards. And again, for me, this is how my path uh, went with uh, running that shared deployment pipeline that I had told you about. It started out uh, with uh, myself and then three other teams that were all hosting websites in the Nike.com domain. We had one thing that worked for the four of us, and I kind of thought it was going to end there. Uh, but all of a sudden, some of our other consumer websites also wanted in other parts of Nike.com. Uh, so we expanded to that middle middle level where uh, you know all across uh, different business units in our area they were using it, and then eventually this became used for our internal websites, our, our partner and B two B websites. So we reached that cross company phase, and for me and my project, each of these phases, kind of cross team, the cross business unit, and then cross company, they all took about about six months or so so each. So there's some time needed to up level, but this maturity model uh, fit maturity model fit and fit fit very well. And this is the way even now where my full-time job is teaching intersource, teaching collaboration among teams, we find this very useful. And what, what we'll do is when we're engaging with a new person or a new team or new organization and want to help teach and move them toward intersource, uh, through consultation and conversation, we'll take a little bit of a mental inventory at where people are at and maybe mentally put a check mark on each of these dimensions. Like this is about how this uh, team or person or org tends to collaborate uh, uh, today. And then moving them toward inner source involves taking in a one of these and then uh, sliding it, sliding it to the right, sliding it more toward inner source. Now, the beauty of this model is that 
each of these dimensions can be up-leveled on its own independently of the, of the others. These aren't necessarily coupled, but we can take any one of these sliders basically and try to, try to up-level it toward the right. Uh, what it does is let people move toward inner source in little gradual baby steps rather than having them have to like, jump all the way to the right. Um, I've heard as I've been talking with people in the industry uh, stories where an inner source advocate might try to teach people uh, behavior all the way on the right. We need to collaborate on, on all of our mainline uh, coding projects with people all across the company. And it's difficult. Uh, folks that we're talking to you may not have the, the skill or experience necessary. And I've heard at times, unfortunately, people kind of throw up their hands and say, uh, oh, they, you know, they just weren't ready for it. I guess it's just not going to work. That's a shame because they may not have been ready to jump all the way to the end, but, but if you figure out where people are at and invite them to just take one step forward, they can do that. And then you can invite them to take another step forward. And often again, uh, they'll get the idea and start up-leveling themselves along these lines of maturity. So it works very, very well. Now, when we invite people to take the next uh, step, this is a social change and a cultural change uh, as much or really much more than a, a process or technical change. And so we've learned a lot about group dynamics and how culture change works at scale. Uh, they're summarized very well in, in this book, in this manual, uh, How Behavior Spreads by Dr. Damon Santola. Now, this is an academic work, and what Dr. Santola has done in, in gone in, and uh, proven and demonstrated very, um, very academically how behavior change happens in, in large social structures, including an enterprise or a corporation. And his basic thesis is that there's two ways to describe how things spread in a social network. And he likens it to the spread of a, of a virus or a contagion. He calls it a, a simple contagion versus a complex contagion. Okay, simple or complex? Well, let me explain. Uh, a, a simple contagion, I think we can all understand because we're actually all living in the midst of a, this giant simple uh, contagion right now, which is the coronavirus. The, the spread of a simple contagion is that one person who is infected with it can spread it to others just by coming into contact with them. And unfortunately for all of us, uh, you know, this is how the coronavirus spreads. So uh, depending on where you are in the world, you're probably stuck at home. Uh, I know I am. And uh, it's not just a, kind of a viral agent like the one we're in right now that spreads this way. Uh, Dr. Santola has shown that information can spread this way in a company. Like someone at the center, uh, maybe a director is indicated in this graph, uh, can communicate to their managers. Uh, the managers are connected with people on the teams that are that are then connected to each other, and then it spreads. So there's some like new initiative represented by this new color. Uh, tell the managers, the managers have got it. Tell the people on the teams, uh, the teams have got it, and you're done. Now, one uh, one kind of fallacy or pitfall around inner source or culture change is assuming that a change in behavior is going to spread the same way. Okay, and I've seen people try to do this, where the leader will say, uh, "Okay, there's this new initiative. We're going to change something about the way we work." Um, uh, you know, we're going to you know, do TDD or, or OKRs or, you know, some kind of behavior or process or, or culture change. Uh, and that's the way it's that's the way it's going to be. And uh, it, it does not spread this way, this change in behavior. But what do people do? Uh, if you're like me, you've probably seen this several times. And the thing that people do, um, again, kind of when that new new behavior as evidenced by that new color is communicated, the thing that people do is they sit and watch and they see, is it, is it actually going to happen? Is anyone going to start doing it? And what they're doing is what Dr. Santola called um, uh, is a complex contagion model of spread. In a complex contagion, one point of interaction with someone who's, who is infected with the new behavior is not enough to cause the behavior to spread. But each person needs multiple points of reinforcement from those that they're connected to socially in order to feel like this new behavior is something they want to adopt. So when that announcement comes out from the uh, um, you know, from some central location, hey, we're going to change the way we do things, people stop and they look and they're looking around them to see, uh, is it actually going to happen? And they watch to see if people around them are doing it. Uh, I hope that's something that you've observed. I know I have many times. Uh, they're exhibiting this uh, complex contagion model of spread. They need multiple points of, of reinforcement. So what we do at Nike, anytime we're inviting someone to up level along that collaboration maturity model, uh, inviting a person, inviting a team, inviting an org to up level, we intentionally set it up so that we know they have multiple points of reinforcement that demonstrate that that new behavior is a good one. And here's how we do it. Uh, when we're targeting a particular org, we'll identify highly connected people that can act as reinforcers for many, many others. Uh, and uh, they are the evangelist. Uh, they get invited to be the evangelist for that new, for that new behavior. Um, 
uh, these highly connected people get invited to be the evangelists and will pull together the evangelists regularly in an evangelist council. This allows these evangelists to reinforce each other in the new behavior uh, since there's nobody in their organizations yet that can act as reinforcers. Uh, so with us and the leader at the center and the evangelists embedded and spread throughout the teams, uh, we can then uh, communicate the new desired behavior uh, that's moving more toward uh, toward inner source on those dimensions. We can communicate that uh, to the uh, to people in the organizations, and they have those multiple points of reinforcement, so they can adopt the new behavior. Those people can then act as reinforcers for the next set of folks that adopt the new behavior, and so on. And the the behavior keeps on on spreading. Okay, uh, so this idea uh, of intentional reinforcement, this complex contagion model of spreading, we've encapsulated it in an easy to understand and remember way that we'll call the two, two, one uh, rule. Uh, let me explain how this works. Uh, when we want to go into an organization, up-level them toward inner source, invite them to take the next step along that maturity model. Uh, you know, Maybe they need to start attending the uh, open meetups, or maybe they need to start opening up their repositories, whatever the next step is. Uh, we'll make sure to uh, that everyone hears two times from their vertical management chain that this new behavior is desirable, usually from their vice president and then their senior director in all hands. We'll also intentionally set it up so they hear two times from their peers. These are the evangelists that this new behavior is good and desired. We'll bring in the evangelists to speak it in all hands, or the evangelists will get into the, uh, the newsletter or the mailing list uh, for this organization. So they're hearing two times vertically, two times horizontally that this new behavior is good and desired. We'll also stack the deck and make sure there's some prominent project in the organization that adopts the new behavior new behavior and is successful. Uh, we had an example of this where uh, in one organization where we presented on, on the value of uh, sharing and uh, marketing projects internally. Uh, we had one project that uh, presented in uh, one of our user forums and meetups. That project was able to, uh, for several months in a row, get a new customer every single month uh, internally within the company through these presentations. They eventually doubled their average rate of adoption uh, for their tool that they were sharing. So that was our shining example. And we made sure that everyone knew about that shining example in, in addition to receiving those social uh, points of reinforcement. So that two, two, one rule, again, two vertical leaders, two uh, horizontal influencers, and one successful project has worked consistently to change behavior. Uh, even though we don't have organizational uh, authority, we can have that influence broadly throughout the company. Now, uh, in ideating kind of what behaviors uh, make sense, what things we should be suggesting. Uh, as Daniel mentioned, we found it very useful to work within the InnerSource Commons. There's a lot of resources there for ideas. Within the InnerSource Commons, there's a series of video and written training segments around InnerSource called The Learning Path. You can find them at this short URL. Uh, there's an open Slack channel that you can join this URL where you can bounce ideas off of other InnerSource practitioners. We found that very useful in getting ideas. And then also there's documented patterns uh, for such and such a challenge that you may have at a company. Here's a pattern that, um, that multiple people in that situation have done in other companies that have worked out successfully. So all of these things uh, give, us, give us ideas uh, when we're stuck trying to up-level a particular org along the maturity model, and then we can roll it out with, uh, with the 221 plan. Uh, so with that, thanks so much. You can find me on the InnerSource Commons Slack. I'm happy to take a personal email.